From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. All NATO defense ministers are meeting today in Brussels in the wake of that renewed and extensive rocket attacks on Ukraine from Russia. To bring us up to speed on exactly what they are doing, what they are saying, we turn now to our Bloomberg European correspondent in Brussels. She's Maria Tadeo. So, Maria, what have we learned from the defense ministers? Well, David, there's two things here. One is that they clearly warned we're now witnessing what is the most severe escalation in the war in Ukraine since it started back in February. A lot of this, of course, in light, and you alluded to this, to the massive strikes that we saw on Monday across Ukraine. Now, the NATO Secretary General, he was crystal clear what the country needs uh, right now is air defense systems. It needs to be able to protect itself from the air. And in fact, if you look at some of the moves by the Russian army over the past three days, it seems we're going back to the old strategy. The they're stuck in defending positions on the ground, so they move uh, to the air, and there's a lot of damage that is done to Ukraine when you fight a war like that from the skies. Now, the other issue here, which is in some ways, well, incredibly important for the European side uh, of NATO, is the critical infrastructure, the energy infrastructure in, uh, well, Europe. And there was also a warning on that note. Well, the Jeff Secretary General also said if it gets compromised, there will be a united and firm response. The question still, and this is still very much to be seen, is what kind of response if you do see the pipelines that some of the underwater systems, cables and so on get damaged in the winter. Yeah, and I saw President Putin warn that global infrastructure and energy is at risk given what's happened with Nord Stream. Thank you so much to our European correspondent, Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo over in Brussels. And now we turn to somebody who lived in Brussels until just recently, Kay Bailey Hutchinson. She's former U.S. ambassador to NATO. Ambassador Hutchinson served as a U.S. senator representing Texas for some 20 years. So, Mr. Madam Ambassador, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Uh, let's go back to NATO and your old home stopping ground. What do they need, the Ukrainians, and what can NATO to provide. Yes, right now, clearly the pivot is to more air defense because, of course, they've used so much of their air defense systems, which were so valuable during that horrible two nights ago strike uh, effort, and now they need to be replenished. So that is the subject they're discussing with the defense ministers in Brussels today, and they're asking other allies for help in pro providing more of this air defense. And of course, the U.S. will step up, um, and that is going to be the, the next thing that we do uh, re really um, you know, we were looking at trying to help them in the south and, and protect uh, those uh, waterways. Now we're going to air, although we've been there already, but even more. You make a really important point. We tend to think here in the United States that it's all the United States. It's not, actually. There are reports that Germany may be supplying some air defense, also the United Kingdom. So it's other members of NATO as well. And Norway, yes. And um, there are several countries that have capabilities, and we are doing this together. There's no question. The U.S. is stepping up to the huge degree, but our allies are as well, and we're calling on them to do more now in the face of this onslaught from Russia. It's just out of sight what Russia's doing right now to their infrastructure. We'll talk about that onslaught because we did have that multiple missile strikes earlier in the week. In addition, we have a new general in charge on the Russian side. He has a reputation in Syria, which is not a very pretty one. It's a horrible one, uh, just decimating uh, Aleppo, Syria. It, this general does not have a good reputation. And it, it seems like Putin is going deeper and deeper into the dark side. Um, you didn't, you wouldn't think that a country with a military would do the atrocities that we are now learning more and more that they have done against the Geneva Convention, but beyond that, just uh, terrorist activities. And this new general does not have a good reputation. And uh, it's hard to see when you see these lines of Russian men trying to leave the country. It's hard to see how you can coalesce around a cause when you're your young people who would fight if it was for Mother Russia, but 
they know deep down this is not for Russia, that this is taking over another sovereign nation and committing atrocities in the process. One story that crossed the Bloomberg just shortly before we came to air is that the U.S. is considering, hasn't decided according to the report, but is considering cutting off shipments of aluminum from Russia. That's something like 10 percent of our supply. Uh, what would be the effect of that, both on the United States but globally? Well, of course, David, we are looking at global effects, but Russia, has, the sanctions on oil uh, have not really cut back on Russia's economy. And in order to bring Russia to their senses, I think more sanctions, more bans uh, are probably in, in the uh, list of options. Um, and I think we need to do more to really crush Russia's ability to buy arms from Iran. They're using Iranian drones right now on the Ukrainian soldiers. So we've got to stop that. How do you do it? You do it by not having them able to afford buying from North Korea, Iran, um, the, the countries that would love to do damage to our Western alliance. One of the big issues casting a shadow over all this is the possibility of the use of nuclear weapons, something that President Putin has very specifically referred to. Uh, at the same time, we had NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg today uh, saying that they haven't seen any indication of that yet. This is part of what he had to say. Russia knows that the nuclear war uh, cannot be won, must never be uh, fought. And um, uh, we are, of course, also closely monitoring um, uh, the Russian nuclear posture. Uh, we haven't seen any changes in the uh, nuclear posture of uh, Russia, but we will remain vigilant. And we had President Biden, of course, yesterday giving an interview to CNN saying he believes that Putin is, quote, rational. What should our position be to make sure that, as Jens Stoltenberg said, nobody ever uses nuclear weapons? We are trying in every way I know. The NATO alliance is to show Putin that if he does this, it is going to be a, a massive hurt on his country, his people, and it, you're, we're trying to get the message across to him that the price is too high. And you would hope he would know that already. Um, he's a nuclear armed nation. And we don't, I'm, every intel report I see says that they don't see the evidence of that. But then, you know, they didn't really see that Putin was really building up for a real invasion. And so you, it, and it's not that they didn't see what was happening. It is they don't know the mind of someone who is committing such atrocities. So we certainly are doing everything to try to show Russia and show Putin that he will hurt if he does something so drastic as using nuclear weapons. I want to end on a question we've gotten just now from a viewer, actually, because I do hear it asked of quite a few people, and you as a former senator and diplomat really can address it. And that is, at what point does, as he said, the allies sue for peace? Do we actually sit down and try to talk to Putin? We heard the President Biden la last night actually said he doesn't know what there'd be to talk to Putin about. But at what point do you actually think about some sort of talks to resolve well, this? Well, I think that President Zelensky has set the bar. If the troops leave the country, if if they even declared a ceasefire and showed that they would keep a commitment to stop this war on their part, then of course you want to sit down and you want to have a discussion. But I think President Zelensky has to lead this effort. We can't try to coerce him into something that isn't right for his country. He has been a magnificent, gifted, spirited leader, and we can't get in front of him on this. But I think the parameter that you have to get your troops out of our country, and then we'll sit down and talk about how we repair all of this, mm -hmm. is the right one for him. And we are supporting him 100 percent. He has shown uh, that they're going to stand for their country above everything else. And they've taken the hits. They've taken the suffering. And we're going to step up to help them repair. We believe they will win. We believe that there will be a time that this will stop. And mainly it's because they're winning and because we're helping them and we're not going to give up. And, and David, I just want to say we are sending a message to the world and, a, and to President Xi and to Putin that we are not going to stop helping Ukraine, this country, fighting for its sovereignty. And that's a message to every 
autocrat in the world that might think that they're going to mess around with the Western alliance, we're not going to, to stop. We're going to support Ukraine, and we're going to send a message to everybody else that would mess around with our democracies and our freedom and our way of life. The powerful message. Thank you so much, Kay, for being here. Really appreciate it. That's Kay Bailey Hutchison. She's former U.S. ambassador to NATO. Coming up, we're going to talk with Democratic Congresswoman Sherry Bustos of Illinois about the midterm elections and what comes next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. To keep you up to date with news from all around the world, we turn now to Mark Crumpton here with the first word. David, thank you. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg urged alliance members to step up supplies of air defense systems to Ukraine, condemning Russian strikes against Ukrainian cities. Both to uh, ensure our own deterrence and defense, but also to continue to provide support to Ukraine. NATO defense chiefs gathered in Brussels to discuss how to better protect critical infrastructure and ramp up weapons production. Bank of Japan Governor Haruhiko Kuroda says he will maintain monetary easing to get inflation up to the central bank's goal, speaking at the Institute of International Alliance International Finance in Washington. He said the Japanese economy is still recovering from the pandemic. We continue our monetary easing in order to achieve the 2% uh, uh, inflation target or, or price stability target in a stable and, and, and a sustainable manner. So the economy is still recovering from uh, the pandemic, so we have to continue to support the economy to recover. Kuroda added that he expects core inflation to rise gradually in coming years. President Biden called the Supreme Court, quote, more of an advocacy group. The president was speaking at a fundraiser when he embarked upon the even-handedness of the high court. That came after a blockbuster term in which justices struck down the constitutional right to abortion and expanded gun rights. If you've been waiting on the perfect time to take a trip to, from the U.S. to the U.K., now may be that time. As the pound weakens and the dollar grows stronger, many British tourist experiences are considerably cheaper than before. Flights, hotels, and even a ride on the London Eye are more expensive in pound terms, but cheaper in dollars. That's according to travel comparison site Kayak. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Well, yesterday, President Biden gave an interview to Jake Tapper of CNN, and one of the things he addressed was the possibility of a recession. I don't think there will be a recession. If it is, it'll be a very slight recession. That is, we'll move down slightly. Well, look, think about what's happened. We have done more. We're in a better position than any other major country in the world. We welcome now Democratic Congresswoman Sherry Bustos of Illinois. So, Congresswoman, thank you for being with us. You heard the president there with perhaps part of the message Democrats will take to the polls coming up just four weeks from right now. Uh, so give us a sense of exactly what you need out of the White House, what you expect out of the White House to help candidates across the country. I, I think the Biden administration is completely committed to doing everything it can within its power, the executive power, to uh, attack inflation. Uh, to make sure that uh, the job, we, we've got uh, record employment, uh, to make sure that that continues, and uh, just everything within their power. Along with the help of Congress, we have passed the Inflation Reduction Act. We passed what's called the CHIPS Act. So we are manufacturing chips at home. We are bringing jobs home. And, I, and look, this is a, this is a global um, economic condition that we're all living through. And the United States is... is weathering this better than most of our uh, industrialized countries. So tell me how that plays in a rural district in Illinois, uh, because that's where you come from. You know that country terribly well. Uh, do your constituents care about what's going on in the rest of the world or just what's going on at the gas pump? 
Well, the gas pump matters a lot. And I can tell you, we have a heck of a lot more uh, F-150s and Silverados than we do Teslas. So uh, every time you pass a gas station and that, that number ticks up, I think it matters a lot. And what we see, early voting has begun in Illinois. And, uh, but the closer we get to November 8th, if, um, if those numbers keep ticking up, I don't think that's good. Um, and it, when you look at a congressional district like the one I represent, uh, the vast majority, 85% of the towns that are in the congressional district I serve are, are um, uh, 5,000 people or fewer. And 60% and or 1,000 people or fewer. So if you think about it from that perspective, you have to drive a little ways to, to get to your job or you're using a lot of fuel when you're harvesting right now. We're in harvest season and we've got close to 10,000 family farms. So that number... David matters a lot, um, and it's why I'm going to throw out uh, uh, my advocacy for ethanol. I, that is one way to bring down the cost of gasoline, and uh, and President Biden has signed an executive order to allow um, ethanol blends of 15% to be to be blended uh, 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 all throughout the year. So um, that is something that's been helpful, and you can you can fill up your your gas tank using ethanol now, and that's one way to bring down the cost. But, you know, I'm, yeah, I think it's something that we have to take a look at, and that price on November 8th will make a difference. Uh, so you've served your 10 years. Congratulations and thank you. Uh, and as I understand it, you've decided not to run again. So you can sort of answer this question without a particular vestige in interest in who, how people vote. But what do people care most about in your district this vote? Is it inflation? Is that number one? And the economy is number one. And it's not just the, the gas tank. It's when you go to the Hy-Vee grocery store or or the Kroger, and, and all of a sudden you see what the a slab of bacon costs or um, a, a dozen eggs. Yeah, that matters a lot. Um, I, I think that that is one of the primary issues, um, if not the primary issue. But the other thing that I'm hearing about, which is a big difference in the time when, from when I first started running to today, and that is women's, um, the choices that they make in the doctor's office. And I wouldn't have thought that 10 years ago that that would be a primary issue. But it is. We saw what just happened in, in Kansas with, um, with, with women turning out in, in huge numbers and defeating that uh, constitutional amendment that they were voting on in, in Kansas. But even in a more rural congressional district like I represent, I would say that the message is nobody wants Uncle Sam in their doctor's office. And, you know, this idea that we should be allowed to make our own health care decisions, we should be allowed to make our decisions about um, our families, that sort of thing. Now, all of a sudden, we've got um, the other side of the aisle that has always, you know, pr uh, tried to present themselves in a way that, hey, we don't want government interference. The Supreme Court is saying, yeah, they they want to make these decisions for us. And I, I think that is a huge motivator. And right now, it the motivator is that the voters are angry about what came out of the Supreme Court. They're angry about um, the um, other side of the aisle saying they want to make this a, a, a national referendum on women's right. health care choices and even have 86 right. Democratic co-sponsors to to ban abortion right. under all circumstances. And I, that that does not go <laughs> over well. Uh, Congressman, let me ask one last area, and I'm not sure whether you're going to have to deal with this, but there is a debt ceiling limit that's going to be coming up that uh, somebody's going to have to deal with probably in the next Congress. There are reports on the Bloomberg, actually, just uh, of, as of yesterday, that some Republicans, if they actually do take control in the House, will use that as a way to really bring some reform to entitlement, Social Security and Medicare. Uh, now, whether that's the right way to do it or not, do you agree something's got to be done about entitlements? Because I think, last time I checked, we're going to go bankrupt at some point. Well, it's not a matter of, of something has to be done about, and I'm not going to use the word entitlement. Look, Social Security is something that anybody who's been in the workforce has paid into their entire lives. And um, it is it is a, a promise that the federal government has made that in your old age, um, you will not be destitute. Um, there's actually going to be the, the largest cost of living increase for Social Security that we've seen um, in um, m maybe ever. And, um, and but but that is a promise that we've made. We can make it sustainable. Um, and it, and is, is the way to do that uh, right to, to look at the cap at which the uh, Social Security benefits are paid in at. It's, a, I don't know, one hundred and thirty thousand dollar income uh, that that after that it's it's cut off. I think that that is something that we can look at raising to make Social Security sustainable. Uh, Medicare is is a, um, a wonderful program. I have an eighty nine year old 
mother who is actually going through health challenges right now. And um, Medicare is there for her, and not just for my mother, but for the, those the seniors who need that help. So um, I don't look at it as entitlements as much as these are programs that we have paid into. We can make them sustainable. And if you want to look at what's happening on the other side of the aisle, um, you've got the, the chair of the National Senatorial Campaign Committee who actually wants to um, uh, take a look at Social Security and cutting that. So um, there is a distinct difference between um, the, the reasonable Democrats and, and um, those on the far, far right and what they want to do with those programs. Do we have to do something with them to make them sustainable? Of course yeah. we do. Yeah. Um, but there are ways to do that to make sure that our seniors are also looked looked out for and that they're not destitute when they're, you know, in their 80s and their 90s. And I don't think we as, as Americans want that to happen. Congresswoman, always such a pleasure to have you on. Very informative. Thank you for your time. That's Democratic Congresswoman Sherry Bustos of Illinois. Still to come, we're going to talk with Ishwar Prasad of Cornell about the IMF World Bank meetings in Washington this week and what they could accomplish. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West, and we want to get a check on the markets right now, not just here, but also in the U.K., for that matter. We turn now to Kriti Gupta to take us through it. So, Kriti, what are we doing here on stocks? Yeah, well, it's a little bit of a wait-and-see mode here. I mean, you have the S&P 500 up about two-tenths of 1%, the NASDAQ up, up about the same margin. Not a ton going on in the macro sphere. A lot of people waiting on that CPI data that we're going to get tomorrow. The PPI coming in just a little bit hotter than expected, but not enough to really uh, dent some of the sentiment. Nevertheless, it, it really is the micro, I think, that's worth paying attention to. Uh, companies like PepsiCo, for example. David, we talk so much about a slowing economy, slowing demand. PepsiCo actually raising their forecast, saying, well, despite inflation, despite those higher prices, at the end of the day, people are still buying. Okay, but we got to get to the UK. We do. This is the Bank of England. What's going on with Gilt says, I just can't quite believe it. Yeah, they're turning in from the buyer of last resort to are we ever going to not be the buyer of yeah. last resort? Really having to rescue some of these pension funds that have been working um, on a or using a hedge hedging strategy that's been working for decades. Nevertheless, the BOE basically saying, all right, guys, we got to get out in about three days. There's some confusion about the deadline. Nevertheless, it's still putting pressure on those yields now. Well, it looks like some of the big banks went to the FT, the Financial Times, and said, you know what? They they might extend it, almost to push Bailey on whether he can really yeah. blink or not. Yeah, that deadline <laughs> confusion. But as Marcus Ashworth put it, I mean, you saw that confusion, but then you did see yields ultimately uh, come out on top. Okay, thank you so much to Kriti Gupta. And you can watch her again at 1 p.m. Eastern time as an anchor on Bloomberg Markets. Coming up, we're going to go over today's eco numbers and preview the CPI numbers out tomorrow with Allison Boxer of PIMCO. And this is Bloomberg. Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West, and for some global news, we turn now to Mark Crumpton here with the first word. David, thank you. In Russia, President Vladimir Putin said the explosions on the Nord Stream gas pipelines set what he called the most dangerous precedent at a Moscow energy forum today. President Putin blamed the act of terror on the United States, Ukraine, and Poland, calling them beneficiaries of the blasts. Mr. Putin added that the attacks, quote, show that any critically important object of transport, energy, or utilities infrastructure is under threat, end quote. In Iran, the unrest following the death of Masha Amini has left 201 people dead, 28 of them children. That's according to an Iran rights group and a charity. Reports from Oslo-based Iran Human Rights Group say scores of school children have been arrested for protesting and for publicly criticizing the leaders of the Islamic Republic. Lockdown fears in Shanghai, schools and other venues are quietly shutting down as officials try to rein in a COVID flare-up that's hit the financial hub. Several schools dotted throughout the city have suspended in-person classes, according to parents and social media posts. COVID prevention offices there say at least five districts have closed entertainment venues, including cinemas, bars, and gyms. Bridgewater Associates co-chief executive officer Nir Bardea said the firm's new leadership has to rewire the organization. Dea spoke at the Bloomberg Invest Conference here in New York. 
This comes after founder Ray Dalio's decision to relinquish control following Dea's promotion to the role alongside Mark Bertolini. With the new blood, the new brain, the new heart, there's a hunger. There's a risk appetite, there are ideas, we talked about this. So in talent, I think just our, our open-mindedness, our desire to move from this founder-led organization to a team-based organization puts a lot more emphasis on finding great players. He added that the transition would make for, quote, a must-win battle. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. We all continue to focus on the U.S. economy with some PPI numbers out today and, more important, CPI coming out tomorrow, all in anticipation of the Fed's meeting in early November to tell us where we're going on rates. To take us through the economy and these numbers, welcome now Allison Boxer. She's Senior Vice President of PIMCO, where she's an economist. So, welcome. It's great to have you here in the studio. Give us your reaction, first of all, to PPI numbers. How important are they? Yeah, absolutely. So we saw PPI uh, sort of surprise on the upside of consensus expectations this morning. Uh, there was some good news if you look through the details and that the consumer goods component of this was at least a little bit softer. That's been trending in the right direction. Uh, but I think if you take a step back, if you look across PPI, if you look across the CPI prints that we've gotten for the last few months, wage data, um, all of those various indicators that, that we're monitoring and that Fed officials are monitoring as they think about the inflation outlook, um, you know, I think we're still seeing things that are just, you know, far too hot for, for Fed comfort across the board, well in excess of, of what's necessary to get inflation back down to the Fed's target, whether you look at PPI or, or other indicators. Yeah, and a lot of people are waiting for those CPI numbers out tomorrow morning, 8.30 Eastern time. Uh, where do you think they're going to come out? I see the projections, that, according to the Bloomberg, the survey, they say that the, the headline number may slow down a bit, although it's still pretty high, like 8.3 percent. The core number actually may go up a little bit, may accelerate a little bit. Yeah, we're seeing some divergence across the headline numbers, which which do look like they've peaked, you know, barring another, uh, you know, sort of commodity price shock. Uh, whereas core inflation, at least on a year over year basis, is expected to tick up. Uh, you know, again, I think it's helpful to take a step back and, and really think about what Fed officials are trying to achieve and what they're focusing on, uh, which is really the underlying trend, the underlying strength and in inflation. Uh, so, so certainly we could we could see some some volatility. We could see another firm CPI print tomorrow. Uh, but, but really, I think that the important thing for for market participants to focus on is is the underlying trend, uh, the strength in shelter inflation and various services components, uh, those types of things, because that's what Fed officials are really focusing on. They want you know sort of smoothing through any noise that we see related to the pandemic or, or those types of things. Uh, they really want to see the underlying trend of inflation cool. Um, and I think unfortunately for Fed officials, we're not likely to see that already tomorrow. That's my question. I I suppose the way I might put it is how much momentum is built into this, and particularly in things like shelter, for example, because as I understand it, that's relatively sticky. That doesn't turn around right away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the shelter component is a, is a particular challenge for Fed officials, tends to be very sticky, tends to be slow moving. And I think, unfortunately, and sort of counterintuitively, uh, we actually tend to see shelter prices go up initially as as Fed, um, you know, Fed, as the Fed is tightening rates, uh, since they're making housing, mortgage rates, purchasing a home, you know, relatively less affordable. Uh, so, so really with the shelter component, but as you look across the core CPI basket more broadly, you know, it does look like things are, are stickier, that the sources of inflation have become somewhat more broad based in the last several months. Um, and so overall, you know, I think that suggests that there is more momentum, and it's going to take more time to get inflation back to Fed target. To flash back six months or years, there was a big debate about whether this is demand-driven inflation or supply, that in fact, maybe the inflation would come down because the supply chains would open up. We'd fix some of the problems we have. Is there any indication of that at this point? Because I don't hear a lot of talk about that anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I think we actually have made good progress on the on the supply side. And I think there are some reasons to be optimistic. Um, you know, we've seen some signs of, of goods inflation starting to cool, uh, some progress as you look across different indicators of supply chain health, shipping prices, and, and those sorts of things. So I think that's the, the good news. We are seeing some progress there. Uh, but, you know, I think, unfortunately, the, the bad news is that, you know, even as these supply type of issues are starting to improve, you know, we're seeing signs that inflation is, is broader and broadening out across other types of categories, and I think that's why you're not hearing as much of a focus on the supply chain issue as we did, you know, earlier in the in the inflation cycle. And what about that goods versus services component, particularly when it comes to wage inflation? If we're going back into services, are we going to see wage inflation there? 
Yeah, I think we have already seen wage inflation. You know, again, last week's payroll report, uh, the, the increase in average hourly earnings was a little bit cooler than, than what we've seen recently. But again, as you, if, as you look across the various different wage indicators, average hourly earnings, the employment cost index, um, the Atlanta Fed's wage tracker, you know, again, all of these indicators suggest that, that wage inflation um, is moving at a pace that, that is really not consistent with, with the Fed's 2% inflation objective. And I think you're seeing that in, in services inflation on the CPI side as well. One thing we left out were Fed minutes. We're going to get those this afternoon. There was a time that we were really uh, eagerly anticipating those Fed minutes. Are you eagerly anticipating them? Are you looking to learn much from them? Yeah, I think we're all, um, you know, market participants are very focused on on CPI tomorrow. So, so Fed minutes have taken a little bit of a back seat, uh, you know. But, but of course, if you think back to the September FOMC meeting, uh, this was a meeting where we got a new set of economic projections and a new dot plot from the Fed. Uh, so, we will be, you know, sort of carefully watching to see if we learn anything more around the the debate around the interest rate path and the economic projections that that came out with that with with those with that Fed statement. Allison, really great to have you with us today. Thank you so much for being here. That's Allison. Boxer, PIMCO economist and senior vice president. Coming up, Cornell professor Ishwar Prasad on what we might get accomplished at the IMF and World Bank meetings this week in Washington. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television Radio. I'm David Weston. Before he was professor of trade policy at Cornell, Ishwar Prasad served at the IMF as head of the financial studies and China divisions. He is also the author of The Future of Money, How the Digital Revolution is Transforming Currencies and Finance, and we welcome him back now. Ishwar, thanks so much for being here. We have the IMF World Bank meetings going on even as we speak in Washington. What do we hope to see come out of those? There is a real sense of concern among the policymakers meeting in Washington about where the world economy is right now. You know, practically every major economy is grappling with some combination of falling growth, high and rising inflation. There are, of course, some exceptions to this country, such as China, uh, where growth is very weak, but um, inflation is not very high yet. Um, but one of the concerns that is top of mind for policymakers practically everywhere is what is going to happen with the Fed and with rate hikes and what that might do to the dollar, because a strong dollar right now is creating a lot of complications um, for every advanced economy and developing economy that is on the other side of the dollar. Um, now, one question is whether there is going to be um, any sort of coordinated response that the world can come up with. And it's not obvious that that is going to be the case. And what the hope was that these IMF World Bank meetings would allow for a focus on longer term issues, such as dealing with uh, uh, climate change, um, dealing with financial system uh, risks and instabilities, and trying to think of how to shore up uh, the difficulties that many developing countries have been facing on account of the Ukraine war and rising commodity prices. But all of those longer term issues, I think, are really giving way uh, to just dealing with what is seen as a very difficult moment in every economy. Well, let's talk about that dollar for a moment. Uh, you've written a book on it, actually, beyond the book that, about uh, digital money. You've written a book on the question of the dollar trap. And uh, give us a sense of what's driving that dollar right now. And compare and contrast, if you would, was when there was a coordinated attempt in the Plaza Accord to really deal with a, a dollar. Is this the same sort of phenomenon, or is it quite different? So at some level, um, what we're experiencing today is similar to the period before the Plaza Accord. And at the time, the dollar was very strong. The U.S. was running a significant current account uh, deficit. Um, and there was a concern that that could threaten global financial instability. We have some similar things going on right now. The U.S. does have a significant current account deficit. But I think one very important difference right now is that practically every country right now is facing um, a very difficult period in terms of uh, uh, low growth and with very little policy space. So I think the reason the dollar is strong is partly because the U.S. has, of course, uh, gotten ahead um, with its rate hikes, but also, relatively speaking, and of course, in international finance, everything is relative, the U.S. growth prospects don't look as bad as those in the rest of the world, um, where there are many more complications. So if you think about Europe, um, the energy um, uh, supply difficulties are really going to hit Europe's growth um, in the next uh, few quarters. Japan has been, been in deep-seated economic malaise and faces a variety of problems. Developing countries are in uh, difficulty. So you have a lot of capital beginning to leave emerging markets coming back to the U.S. 
So the strong dollar is a symptom of that, but the problem is that it's also exacerbating these problems. Uh, for countries that have issued a lot of dollar-denominated debt, this is going to mean tighter financing conditions, uh, more difficulty in um, paying off uh, those debts, and a depreciating um, currency relative to the dollar does mean um, that for many countries that are going to be even greater inflationary pressures, but on the other side, they don't get many of the benefits of a weaker currency, of a weaker domestic currency, because they cannot export that much more into a weakening global economy. So you get all the downsides of a stronger dollar, but none of the upsides of a depreciating currency. So for the rest of the world, the strong dollar is becoming a fairly serious problem. Ishvar, you mentioned growth two or three times there. We had the IMF estimates come out yesterday, really take down global growth, and there's even warnings of a global recession quite possibly coming up. Uh, go back to something you teach every day, and that's trade. Uh, bring us up to speed on world trade. It obviously dropped off precipitously uh, after the uh, pandemic hit, but has it come back and will it come back given some of the concerns about globalization? So it came back quite strongly um, uh, earlier this year, and there were concerns, in fact, um, that the global trading system was uh, um, increasing um, demand for goods to be uh, transported across national borders and within uh, borders as well, and that there were supply constraints. In fact, those supply constraints have begun to ease up a little bit, um, and there are many economies around the world right now um, where, in fact, uh, trade has begun to deteriorate. So if you take an economy like China, for instance, um, imports have begun to uh, weaken, but exports have begun to weaken as well um, because we are seeing much weaker global demand. So certainly trade is an important bellwether of where the global economy is going, and it doesn't look very good right now. Um, in addition to supply constraints and weak demand, of course, we have um, uh, rising commodity prices, which have also um, serve to hit trade, and that also constrains um, the amount of policy space in many developing countries in particular. Talk about the second largest economy in the world, China. Uh, we're, we're about to go into the 20th Party Congress here. President Xi is up for a third term. Everyone expects him to get it. Uh, at the same time, give us a sense of where China is. I know you ran that division for the IMF. Where's China's economy? Is it slowing as badly as people are worried about? So with the party congress and with the presumed re-coronation of Xi Jinping as uh, president for a third term, the watchword in Chinese economic policymaking circles seems to be stability. So there is no going back on the zero COVID strategy, which the government seems very committed to. But the reality is that um, China, too, is running out of policy space. Um, China has not been able to use monetary policy very effectively because the renminbi uh, or yuan has been depreciating quite significantly against the dollar. And if China cut interest rates or loosened monetary policy um, because China doesn't have that much inflation yet, that could cause capital outflows because the interest differential with the U.S. would widen and that could put further downward pressure on the renminbi. Um, so right now, China is facing this confluence of negative factors, not just a short-term growth momentum weakening, but also a housing market that is in disarray and financial markets that don't seem to be doing well as well. So the financial system stresses are beginning to bubble over. So all things considered, it's going to be a pretty tough year uh, for China. One last question, uh, Ishvar. Uh, how much of this has to do with Russia's invasion of Ukraine? I mean, there's an awful lot of issues, whether it's supply chains or fighting inflation, increased interest rates. But how much has Russia really complicated things for the globe? It's really been a significant shock, uh, especially in terms of commodity prices. And then if you think about what disruptions in energy supplies mean to many of the core economies, especially uh, Europe, it's a very significant effect. Now, of course, context matters. The Russia invasion of Ukraine coming on top of post-COVID supply disruptions and um, liquidity in the financial system beginning to create financial market stresses um, was what made it uh, have this very potent effect. Um, so certainly a very important contributing factor, one among many. Come back to trade for a second with respect to Ukraine. How much has the Russian invasion of Ukraine disrupted global trade flows? It's been quite significant. I think there are concerns that um, uh, geopolitical uncertainty, geopolitical risks are ramping up. Uh, so I think uh, financial assets are beginning to come back to their home markets. And there is a dampening of business and consumer confidence around the world, which is certainly going to have an impact on cross-border trade. So let me come back to the big question at IMF and World Bank, if I could, Ishvar. What is the best result you can see coming out of these meetings? If it all worked perfectly, what would come out of it? 
So a best case scenario might be one where um, leaders around the world come up with a coordinated strategy to deal with these supply side problems. Now there is a geopolitical element to it. If there is a way to deal with that, that would be uh, great. But there are um, measures that countries can take, especially to stabilize financial markets. Right now, there is a real sense that monetary policy and fiscal policy in many countries, the um, UK example being a prime one, are not working in concert. So what we really need to think about are policies that can support short-term growth, but also improve long-term productivity. And some sort of coordinated measure uh, to take steps in that direction, I think, would be useful. Okay, Ishvar, thank you so much for being with us. Always appreciate that. Ishvar Prasad, Professor of Trade Policy at Cornell. Coming up, we're going to talk about exactly what's going on in the markets one more time as we get ready for those CPI numbers yesterday, tomorrow, I'm sorry, and as we also take a look at the IMF World Bank meetings down in Washington. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West, and I dare say the big market story right now has to do with the United Kingdom and guilt and what is going on with the Bank of England. And to take us into all of that, we welcome now Bloomberg Senior Markets Editor John Authors, who has a piece out on the Bloomberg in which he talks about British Reserve, I think you call it. I think we're not yeah. seeing that right at the moment, much British Reserve, John. No, the, the, <laughs> the, we're, we're proud of our uh, ability to for, for understatement, and we didn't get anything much in the way of understatement from Andrew Bailey yesterday, which has caused the latest really, really chaotic twist in the saga of uh, the gilts market. Well, if, if there's anybody who doesn't hasn't followed this, Andrew Bailey yesterday, as I understand, said that deadline of Friday is a real deadline. We're not going to stay buying these long term gilts. In the meantime, the FT this morning, I open it up and yeah. the top story is, oh, by the way, they're talking about extending it. Full disclosure, I spent most of my career at the FT. Um, I, I, I read it first thing every morning, John. Generally, <laughs> generally speaking, generally speaking, stories like that don't get into the FT if they're not true. Uh, and they probably don't get into the FT if the Bank of England hasn't hasn't uh, uh, gone to great lengths to tell them otherwise. Um, mm. So the fact that such contradictory messages can get into the FT of all places, the, the house organ of the City of London virtually, from describing something so vital that the Bank of England is going to do is, is I just cannot think of a precedent for it. We should say the, 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 the FT has done another story since the one you read this morning, right, saying, uh, actually, no, they are definitely going to stop buying back bonds on, uh, on Friday. Well, well so uh, let's speculate for a moment. Is this two parts of the Bank of England? I mean, is there something of an insurrection going on? Part of it doesn't, isn't talking to the other part? I, I don't... I, I don't know about that. I, I, obviously, something has gone wrong with the with the clarity of the communications. One possibility is that they were having private communications about the possibility of uh, giving them more time. Uh, and then, for some reason, Andrew Bailey decided to go public saying, actually, no, I'm not going to let you get away with this or I'm not going to let you not give you a, as much rope as you were expecting. So, John, normally for somebody like you and I, it's sort of good fun to watch this go on. But there's yeah. real money involved here. There are real issues. I mean, are the pension plans put in a position so they can actually unwind everything by the deadline on Friday? Uh, as far as I can tell, that's going to be really difficult. Um, that said, you know, their pension plans, you've got a lot of time to bargain with when a, with a pension plan. Um, if the, I still find it very hard to imagine that their ultimate solvency is at stake because they are guaranteed pensions. The uh, somebody, yeah, the, the whole point of a, of a of a defined benefit, a final salary pension scheme, is that you, the pensioner, don't yeah. take the risk; the employer does. For a lot of those pensions, the employer is ultimately the UK taxpayer. So this could end up just creating even more of a dent in the national budget, but I don't see the, I still find the idea of, of pensions actually not going paid very, very hard to imagine. No offense, but I think uh, the Bank of England may be making Liz Truss look good in her big government at the moment. <laughs> it, was, it was the one insti British institution that was still looking fairly exactly. competent, and now it's yep. joined the party. Was. Okay, thank you so much to Bloomberg Senior Markets Editor John Authors. Check out the Balance of Our newsletter on the terminal and also online, and this is Bloomberg.